Oh, I think we're already streaming on YouTube. I've got a little notification. Okay. Saying that we're now live on YouTube, which is positive. So once I get the link to the live stream, then we can share it on our other okay. social media platforms. It's just redirecting me now. Yes, fantastic. Okay, it's working. Um, so I'm just going to pause us on YouTube so you don't get that weird echo sound coming back. Beth, I'm going to copy the link onto my event page, onto your event page, and then people should be able to find us there. If anyone can you has give me already... The link? Can you give me the link first? Yeah, absolutely. Um, hi to anyone who's um, already found their way to us on YouTube, and I'm really sorry if... Uh, well, I guess you won't have been waiting on Facebook for us because Facebook has decided it's just not playing ball at all with the live stream capabilities. It's so annoying. Um, so Beth and I are having to do it through YouTube now as well. So I'm just sharing the go live links with uh, Beth and um, also sharing them on my own uh, artist page on um, Facebook and on my personal Facebook page as well. On Facebook uh, you want to mute me, Beth, because otherwise it's going to get echoey. I can hear myself back at the moment. There we go. That's better. I can't hear myself now. That's better. Um, hello to anyone who's joining us. And I'm really, really sorry that we're starting this so late. Um, I, my astrology friends tell me Mercury is in retrograde and to watch out for gremlins in the system and whatever. And I guess that's happened to us tonight because after a week of having perfect tech runs with no problems, Facebook Live has now decided it wasn't going to work and it was just going to show us a black screen when we were trying to go live. Yada, yada, yada. We finally managed to find a workaround and what we're doing is we're live streaming this via YouTube and copying the event link into our um, into our uh, social media pages and things on Facebook so that people should be able to find us. Um, I, as I say, I'm just sh uh, sharing all the links now um, to the events on our various uh, media pages. I think that's that's all of us covered now so people should be able to um to see us um to see what's going on um i will as i say go back to the youtube live stream and then i should be able to see comments as they appear um there we go um okay so um it says that there's a few people viewing so i guess um i guess we're it's finally worked it's finally working which is good news um so yeah Hi, good evening. Welcome to this uh, very special event and apologies again for the late start. Um, I'm here with Beth Webb and Beth's going to be sort of hosting this evening, telling some lovely stories uh, and myths, interesting bits of history about all things Covid related. Isn't that right, Beth? Oh, Beth, you've muted your. <laughs> Sorry, Beth, you've muted yourself on Zoom there rather than in um, YouTube, so I can't hear you now. That's better. Are you, is it? No, you're still muted. We need to be able to hear each other, guys, otherwise the songs and the stories, they won't match up. Uh, no, Beth, you're muted in Zoom. You need to open Zoom, I think, and click the unmute button in the bottom left hand corner. I, I still can't hear you, Beth. That's better. Okay. That's better. There we go. Oh, but I'm still better. getting you speaking and 20 seconds ago. Um, have you got the, the YouTube um, tab open? Because what's probably happening is you've got me unmuted in the YouTube tab. tab. We, got, we got this whole thing real smooth using uh, Facebook Live, guys. It was like a really slick operation. And now, sadly, we've got a different kind of streaming platform so we're just getting that set up we are really sorry to be a little bit late have you have you managed to have you got youtube open beth in one of your i have tabs? and i've muted you on youtube and i'm yep. still getting you 20 seconds ago mm -hmm. um i don't know I don't know why that would be. As I say, the only reason why there would be a, a delay is if there was a, a tab open um, sort of showing the... You haven't got Facebook or anything like that open as well, still, with the video playing. Okay. Can you say something, Mary? 
Yeah, one, two, three. Okay, I think I've done it. Okay, brilliant news. <sighs> okay, so okay, we'll... great. I'm just gonna <laughs> I'm just gonna add the um the necessary links and everything, guys, to our live streams just before we get started. Um, on um the I've, the live streams that I've got running on my Facebook page, on my Facebook music page, and Beth will be able to upload her links as well. Um, these just take you through uh, to a few different places. There's one that will take you through to our Ko-Fi, which is somewhere where you can make a donation. If you enjoy the content, once we get started, if you're enjoying what we're doing, then yeah, consider making a donation. Um, there's also a link um, that will take you through to uh, places where you can um, find more of our material. So um, places where you can listen to Beth telling her stories, um, places where you can hear um, uh, places when you can where you can buy Beth's books as well um, will show up, which is great. And there's also a couple of links on there to my website, um, and also some links to um, to Dora Darling's website as well. And um, she'll get a mention later on because she drew my attention to this wonderful old folk song, and she's got her own version of it that's just wonderful. And we didn't feel that it would be right to uh, for me to sing it and not give Dora uh, a mention and, and a thank you for introducing me to her. Uh, to her wonderful rendition. Um, so wherever you're watching now, YouTube or Facebook, um, those links should be starting to show up um, uh, sort of by me uh, underneath the chat or by Beth underneath the chat. So if yeah, you want to donate or you want to uh, tune in in future to uh, listen to, um, uh, to Beth or to me, um, uh, or to, uh, you know, purchase best books or anything like that, and then you'll be able to do that. Um, so I'm just adding those links now. Um, but other than that, uh, and without much further ado, I think uh, when we're ready, we should probably get started, shouldn't we? <laughs> we started a little bit late. <laughs> right. Once again, big apologies for the late start. We had this text so smooth. It was smooth as a cat's fur. And of course, when it came to the time, um, the software we were using just refused to load. We suspect that probably everybody's doing shows and chatting and stuff tonight, which is why, but we're not sure. Anyway, welcome to our evening of COVID-19 <coughs> sorry, of COVID-19 or 19 Crows. Now, um, it's quite interesting why we're doing this show. When lockdown started, I began to do daily storytelling for children. And Mary, being a bit of a big kid and trying to avoid doing her PhD um, thesis. It's all right. It's, got, all, it's all done now. Yeah, it's all done. <laughs> I passed. Yay. Wonderful news. Passed my viva. But she sort but. of wriggled out of work a bit by listening to the children's stories. And she said, could we have some stories about crows, um, ravens, magpies, that sort of thing? Because I love the Corvid Day. Mm, and I said, well, amazing. I know the stories but they're very dark. They're not really children's stuff. So we decided to do a show all about crows, ravens, magpies, jackdaws, that sort of thing. But uh, it is not a children's show. Mm. Um, now, the reason it's called 19 Crows or COVID-19 is because I'm not very bright. When COVID-19 first became a thing, I kept thinking, why have they called it after crows? But of course, I was muddling up COVID and COVID. And that was just too good an opportunity to miss. We had to get 19 crows or magpies or ravens, 19 COVID day into the show. Now, we don't know if we've done it or not. Well, at least I think we have. But Mary and I can't agree on how many birds we've actually got into the show. So if anybody wants to actually take notes see what see how many you can count and let us know that would be awesome there are no prizes but as mary and i can't actually agree on how many uh corvid day we've got in the show we'd love to know how many you count so um mary um you, i think you've done all the preamble and you mentioned ko-fi and all of that sort of thing so I think I will just, excuse me a minute, <coughs> go straight into folklore. Yes, excellent stuff. Um, now, I love the Norse legends, you know, the Scandinavian legends about Thor and Odin and that sort of thing. 
and the ravens were particularly important to these ancient legends. Um, for the ancient Norse people, uh, thought and memory were represented by two ravens, one on each of Odin's shoulders. Hugin was thought and Munin was memory. And when we were preparing the show, we spent ages trying to find stories about these magnificent birds. But we couldn't find any stories just about them. They're mentioned a lot. Um, and I contacted a, a young friend of mine who is a Viking reenactor. Hello, Finn. I don't know if you're watching. And he came up with one stanza of an old poem. So I said to Mary, hey, we've got we've got a poem, we've got a poem. And she said, it's great, but it's too short. And so um, we put our heads together and we have come up with our own song that Mary and I have written together. Yeah, and I'm going to perform that for you now. We've called it Odin's Song for want of a better name, but I suppose you could call it Hugin and Moonen if you wanted to maintain the names of the amazing corvids uh, that that serve the god Odin in this song. And as I say, um, Beth uh, put the lyrics together for this and I have um, set it to some music. Um, so I really hope you like it. I'll just get my guitar set up. Oh, one second, got to turn my original sound off. That's better. <laughs> Zoom can sometimes reject guitar noise unless you click a particular button. <laughs> Try again. Losing morning 
with eye and ear alert by thought and memory well served well served by his two morbid birds awaiting ragnarok awaiting ragnarok wow there we go. Who can that end Absolutely fabulous. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, Beth, for helping me write it. <laughs> I mean, it's just so gory that one of the birds picks the brains of hanged people and the other one of battle, uh, the battle slain, and he brings their memories, you know, the sort of bringing flesh to bring people's thoughts and memories to Odin. Ah, brilliant, though. Um, still on the subject of ravens, the First Nation peoples of Canada and Alaska, uh, ravens are very, very important. Uh, in some of their mythology, uh, the raven is a creator. Uh, they also have a raven as a trickster god. Um, it and the, the trickster is very similar to Loki. Um, it depends on the legend in the First Nation whether they're one and the same. The trickster is also a creator or uh, in other First Nations stories, they're two completely separate characters. Now, many cultures see ravens as psychopomp. And when I first heard the word psychopomp, I thought it was some weird, trendy, modern, new cultural movement. Psychopomp sounds quite cool. <laughs> but apparently it's an ancient word, an ancient Greek word, psychopompos, which means the guide of souls. And um, it's thought that the idea comes from um, the ravens, well, and all the corvidae are carried and carrion eaters, picking strips of uh, dead me uh, of meat off uh, people either who'd been put to death or died on the battlefield. And they love to, to uh, attack around a wound. They're not very good, even though they've got strong beaks, they're not very good at getting through unbroken skin but they go to a wound or the eyes they like eyes um, and then tear off strips of flesh and fly away with it and so obviously in olden days people thought that they were taking a bit of that person and then the soul could follow that bit of themselves and these birds would fly off to Hades the god of the underworld and guide the spirit so by taking a bit of that person the spirit could follow as a sort of um, avatar, if you like, and it takes it, and that's what psychopomp means. Um, and I have, I think, Mary, you've got a story about King Arthur and ravens? Um, I have a little bit. Um, I'm not sure whether this is to do with the same kind of, um, this, whether this has its origins and the same kinds of kind of you know like motifs traditions but I do know uh, and it's almost not enough for a story which is why I'm chipping in with it as the, <laughs> like I love my Arthur stuff as anyone watching this will probably know um in Cornwall um for um, quite a long time now I'm not sure about in the middle ages but certainly towards the end of it and afterwards um there are reports that people believed um that King Arthur survived in uh ravens and crows um, and that, that when you saw a raven or a crow, you had to treat it with respect because that was how King Arthur was living on and keeping an eye on everything until, I guess, his comeback to save everybody at the appropriate time. Um, so I don't know if that's something that people already knew about, um, but it's not the not a hugely wide known Arthurian tradition and quite an interesting one, I think. Um, yeah. Well, you know, and I know his uh sleeping under Glastonbury tour, but we don't tell people who aren't from Somerset. <laughs> oh, it's a contentious topic, Ben. <laughs> Best not to broach it. <laughs> anyway, most of the Corvidae family are considered either as very bad luck or very good luck and strongly protective, not much in between. Uh, it depends on the circumstances of the story. For example, there's a, a very old story about a Roman tribune, Marcus Valerius. And he was on campaign in Northern Italy in 349 BC. And the Gauls were coming to attack Rome. And of course the Roman soldiers were coming North to stop the Gauls. And the two uh, armies were drawn up face to face and an enormous Gaul strode out of the Roman army and challenged any of these puny Romans to fight him single-handed. 
Uh, it was quite a, it was a very old fashioned way of settling a battle was to have two champions fight. It was a normal way of doing things. And um, nobody moved except this one man, Marcus Valerius, and he strode out and said, yes, I'll fight you. Oh, sorry, I'll fight you. And um, just as he was putting on his helmet, a huge raven flapped down and landed on his helmet. Now, this could have been seen as a very, very bad omen, but Valerius did not blink, he didn't wince. He went on sword drawn towards the Gaul. And as he did, the raven leapt up and flapped and scratched at the Gaul's face and eyes. So the Gaul couldn't see where to swing his club or his sword. And so Marcus Valerius managed to finish the man off in short time. And so as he lay dead at his feet, of course, the Romans were cheered on and the Gauls were dismayed. The Romans attacked and it was a decisive victory. And for his bravery, Marcus Valerius was richly rewarded, but he was also given the extra name Corvus, which means, um, well, crow, raven, any of that sort of family. Um, and so he was always known as Marcus Valerius Corvus as a reward for his defeating of the Gaul. Um, with the help of the raven. Um, but stories about the Corvidae come from all over the world. Uh, there's a fascinating Judaic story about why we bury our dead. And um, in the book of Genesis, the first book of the Bible, when Cain and Abel's, sorry, when um, Adam and Eve's son, Cain, slew his brother Abel, um, Adam and Eve didn't know what to do with this dead body. They'd not had a a dead human before and a raven flew down and started scratching at the earth to give them a clue that if they dug a hole they could bury him and so according to Judaic tradition that's why we bury our dead. Um, and there's a Islamic story um, about the prophet Muhammad who was fleeing from enemies and he hid in a cave and um, a raven which happened to be white in those days, was flying past and saw the prophet hiding in the cave and went down to his pursuers and said, gah, gah, which means cave, cave. But his pursuers didn't realize the raven was actually speaking to them and they ignored him and they rode past the cave. And so the prophet was saved. And when he came out, he was very grateful to God for saving him, but he was livid with the raven and he cursed him and blasted him with a fiery curse and singed him black. So that's why the crow is black. And he also condemned him never to say anything else other than gah, gah, for the rest of his life. Um, crows, of course, are known for their intelligence and cunning. And many cultures pay tribute to their winged wisdom. Take, for example, Aesop's uh, story, The Crow and the Pitcher. Now, a pitcher, of course, is a big earthenware pot used for carrying, well, anything you like, really, but water or food or whatever. There was once a crow and it was flying over the edge of the desert and it was hungry and it was thirsty. It hadn't seen a pool or a stream or an oasis for miles and it was so exhausted. And then down below on the road, it saw a broken pitcher, just an earthenware jar. And he knew that humans sometimes carried water in such things. So he spread his wings and he swooped down and landed on the rim of the jar and looked inside. And although it was broken, there was still water in the bottom. He could see it, he could smell it, but he couldn't quite reach it. And the crow thought, if I bounce on the rim of this pot, I could maybe tip it. But then he realized that the water would then spill out and he'd lose the lot and he wouldn't get anything to drink. And so he decided that he would somehow bring the level of the water up. And the road was made of lots of small stones. So he picked the stones up in his beak and he dropped them carefully in the pitcher. And as he did, and the water level rose, eventually it came to the top. And the crow, perching on the rim, put his head down and drank to his heart's content. They're such clever birds. I love I, I, that. And do you know what I love about that story? It's such a simple story, but I think a lot of Aesop's fables are, are full of um, animals doing strange things like having races. 
with each other, you know, I think you can taught us in the hair here, but that one, I can completely see a crow doing something like that, can't you? I, I probably... Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and magpies, of course, and, and this is a similar story, but with mischief, mischief. Ah. Um, <laughs> they're usually thought of as thieves, especially of bright, shiny objects. There's a French story, La Pie Voleuse, a servant girl facing the guillotine accused of stealing silverware from her employer. Um, she was saved at the last moment because another servant found the master's missing silverware in the very untidy tangled nest of the master's pet magpie. And so the girl was set free. And this became a stage play in 1815. And then in 1817, Rossini liked the opera, liked the story so much, he turned it into an opera, La Gazza Ladra, the, the Thieving Magpie. But interestingly enough, Exeter University did some research a couple of years ago and found that magpies aren't particularly attracted to, to shiny objects at all. So who knows where the idea came from? Perhaps in reality, the servant in the French story hid her faster, master's silverware in the magpie's nest in case she got caught. And the poor magpie has been blamed ever since. Um, and there's lots of superstitions for magpies. Have you got any, Mary? I was just about to chip in and say um, uh, that it's the one kind of superstition that seems to really genuinely survive, um, at least in my experience, you know, growing up in the Southwest anyway. Uh, my father, who may be or may not be watching, um, is quite a cynical man about a lot of things, but he always, he's very superstitious about magpies. He always has to greet them. He always counts them. He taught me the rhyme, you know, one for sorrow, two for joy, three for a girl four for a boy five for silver six for gold seven for a secret never told uh, so I remember him saying the rhyme and I also remember him greeting magpies um, but he only had to do it before midday I think and um, he would greet them and he'd also ask how the wife and all the little magpies were doing as well um, and apparently if you don't do that yet yeah, it's very very bad and the devil will come for you and things so it's just interesting to to me anyway, that's one of the most cynical people in my life uh, was superstitious about my pies. I'm not sure why. It's yeah. quite weird. Um, I was getting ready uh, for the show this evening and I got out this necklace, which is silver, and I put it on the bathroom windowsill and I could immediately hear my mother saying, don't put it near an open window because a magpie might steal it. Um, but as I say, there's mischief, the a bit of a low key character maybe. Uh, but they're either very good luck or very bad luck, as, as the rhyme you uh, just quoted shows. Some people bow or salute or curtsy to avert bad luck. But in County Mayo in Ireland, you must put your hand in your pocket and hold on to your money just in case a magpie steals it. Now, a group of magpies is sometimes called a murder. Um, murder of crows, murder of magpies. I don't know about a murder of ravens. Why? Possibly because they are carrion eaters. Um, I don't think they actually murder animals. I think they wait for them to be dead. Um, but they're also the Corvidae are often called a parliament, parliament of crows, parliament of ravens, possibly because when they join together, they tend to be full of useless chatter <laughs> and never really seem to do anything. <laughs> oh, excellent. I know, I've just, you know what you've just reminded me of actually, Beth, and we, this didn't even crop up in all the times we've, we've gone through this together, this show, but um, Chaucer wrote The Parliament of Fowls, didn't he? It was a, oh, there's yes. a, a text that Chaucer wrote, and the, that was very satirical. He was satirising what was going on in his society. So maybe there's a longer tradition of uh, Parliament representing a group of birds that we just uh, we, has become kind of lost from mainstream culture. Um, if anyone knows of anything that me and Beth have missed, please drop us a message and let us know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, definitely. So magpie superstition isn't all bad. It's good luck if a magpie jumps in your path when setting off on a journey. If you see three magpies on the way to a wedding, then that foretells a happy future for the bride and groom. And in olden days, if it was thought if you suffered from epilepsy, if you ate a magpie, it would cure you. 
oh goodness gracious I don't know if I cures. fancy that cure no I thought I've, I've never fancied I like you know I like a bit of game but I'm not sure how I'd feel about eating carrion um carrion crows or anything like that uh, um you don't so, know who they've you don't know who they've eaten what they've been eating <laughs> exactly um so I've actually got a song for everyone in a minute that's got a whole load of wonderful uh, magpie folklore rolled up into it it's one of my oh, favorite lovely. songs but before I do that I'm just going to quickly check in with our live chat because finally we managed to get go live successfully and I can see everyone's lovely comments on YouTube and um, lots of people who've checked in to listen to us um, Jamie Jamie has asked whether a, a one crow could be called an attempted murder which I love <laughs> I, th I think I think we should try and make that happen I think that's brilliant um, and um, yeah I, I've just put up a little message on there as well saying if anyone can remember any other magpie law or law relating to crows or ravens from their childhood or anywhere else please share it with us because we'd love to hear it the thing that makes folklore really great is you know it's it's alive in people it's things that we hear about so i'd love to hear about your folklore uh, experiences with corvid um but for now i have a song for you um this i first heard this one uh because there is a really wonderful folk duo called the unthanks oh, um, I love this. who are yeah wonderful uh, sister duo um who perform uh, wonderfully kind of um creepy sounding songs sung really beautifully in harmony um this song i think originally was written by a folk writer a folk songwriter called davy dodds um some years ago um, and it's been performed a couple of times by a few different artists, but the Unthanks have really kind of brought it to everyone's attention. Some of you um, might have heard this in Detectorists, which is a oh. series on the TV about people who go out metal detecting looking for shiny objects. So it's quite appropriate that they should pick a song about a magpie recently. In fact, I don't need my guitar for this one. I don't know why I've picked it up because I'm actually going to sing this one completely a cappella for you. Normally it would be in harmony but I'm going to do it the old-fashioned folky way and sing it without any instruments. So this is the magpie. One's for sorrow, two's for joy. Three's for a girl and four's for a boy. Five's for silver, six for gold. And seven's for a secret never told. Devil, devil, I defy thee. Devil, devil, I defy thee. Oh, devil, devil, I defy thee. Oh, the magpie brings us tidings of news both fair and foul. She's more cunning than the raven, more wise than any owl. For she brings us news of the harvest, of the barley, wheat and corn. And she knows when we'll go to our graves and how we shall be born. And one's for sorrow, two's for joy. Three's for a girl and four's for a boy. Five's for silver, six for gold. Seven's for a secret that's never told. Devil, devil, I defy thee. Devil, devil, I defy thee, oh devil, devil, I defy thee. She brings us news when from the right and grief when from the left. Of all the birds that are in the air, we know to trust her best. For she sees us at our labour, and she mocks us at our work, and she steals the egg from out of the nest, and she can mob the hawk. And one's for sorrow, two's for joy. Three's for a girl, and four's for a boy. Five for silver, six for gold. And seven's for a secret never told. Oh, devil, devil, I defy thee. Devil, devil, I defy thee, oh devil, devil, I defy thee. The 
priest, he says we're wicked to worship the devil's bird. Ah, but we respect the old ways and we disregard his word. For we know that they rest uneasy as we slumber in the night. And we'll always leave a little bit of meat for the bird that's black and white. There we go. That's the magpie. <laughs> Wow, that is absolutely fabulous. Thank you, it's Mary. A, thanks, Beth. It's a great song. It's got so much, so many different bits of magpie folklore kind of brought together like shiny pieces and for a magpie's nest and all put together. I love in the one change song. in tempo and everything. It just really gets you. That's the yeah, I think thing. that the change in tempo actually is great because it encompasses the nature of magpies. Are they this kind of, uh, you know, this kind of creepy, sinister bird or are they mischievous and playful? And it's kind of like the two uh, personalities of the magpie, I think, that kind of come up in that song. Uh, yeah, I really like it. I'm glad you do as well, Beth. So that's oh, fabulous. Great. Well, when one thinks about ravens and literature, it's probably the poem The Raven by Edgar Allan Poe that springs to mind first one of my favourites and I have to say if any of my um, English literature friends from up at Bristol uh, who are gothicists are watching I know that they'll be hopping on the edge of their seat for this because it, it's a, a real favourite. <laughs> oh it's very very gothic and this uses the folklore that ravens are linked with prophecy but in a gorgeously gothic setting. One cold, windy winter's night, the poem's narrator is thinking about his dead love, Lenore, when he hears a tapping at the window. He opens it, heart pounding, wonder if it could be Lenore returning from the grave to greet him. But out from the darkness, a raven flies in and perches on a statue above his door. The narrator asks the raven his name and he replies, nevermore. Intrigued, the narrator wheels a chair towards the door so he can consider the raven. Then upon the velvet sinking, I betook myself to linking, fancy unto fancy, thinking what this ominous bird of yore, what this grim, ungainly, ghastly, gaunt and ominous bird of yore meant in croaking nevermore. Thus I sat engaged in guessing, but no syllable expressing to the fowl whose fiery eyes now burned into my bosom's core. This and more I sat divining, with my head at ease reclining on the cushion's velvet lining that the lamplight gloated o'er. But whose velvet violet lining with the lamplight gloating o'er she shall press ah never more then methought the air grew denser perfumed from an unseen censer swung by seraphim whose footfalls tinkled on the tufted floor wretch I cried, thy God hath lent thee by these angels, he has sent thee respite, respite and nepenthe from thy memories of Lenore. Quaff, O oh, quaff this kind nepenthe and forget this lost Lenore. Quoth the raven, nevermore. Prophet, said I, thing of evil, Prophet still, if bird or devil, whether tempter sent or whether tempest tossed thee here ashore, desolate yet all undaunted, on this desert land enchanted, on this home by horror haunted, tell me truly, I implore, is there, is there balm in Gilead? Tell me, tell me, I implore, quoth the raven, nevermore. Prophet, said I, thing of evil, prophet still, if bird or devil, by that heaven that bends above us, by that God we both adore, tell this soul with sorrow laden, if within the distant Aden, it shall clasp a sainted maiden, whom the angels name Lenore, clasp a rare and radiant maiden, whom the angels name Lenore, quoth the raven, nevermore. Be that word our sign of parting, bird or fiend, 
I shrieked, upstarting. Get thee back into the tempest and the night's plutonian shore. Leave no black plume as a token of that lie thy soul has spoken. Leave my loathsomeness unbroken. Quit that bust above my door. Take thy beak from out my heart and take thy form from off my door. Quoth the raven. Never more. And the raven, and the raven, never flitting, still is sitting, still is sitting on that pallid bust of Pallas just above my chamber door. And his eyes have all the seeming of a demon's that is dreaming. And the lamplight o'er him streaming throws his shadow on the floor and my soul from out that shadow that lies floating on the floor shall be lifted never more. Wonderful. Beth, that is one of my literary favourites, I have to say, and, and you've read it so beautifully. Um, we'll come back to that prophetic quality that, um, that the raven is endowed with a little bit later on with my last song. Um, but in the meantime, I have another song for you to do with ravens, um, if you'd like to hear it. Um, just checking in with our live stream chat to see how everyone's doing. Ah, Liz Thompson has asked for Twa Corbys. Well, that will get a mention in just a second, Liz, but I have another song for you first. Um, I'm really pleased people are enjoying it. Just a reminder that if people are really, really enjoying tonight and want to, they can make a donation at my um, Ko-Fi page that I've set up for me and Beth. And that's just ko-fi, ko-fi.com forward slash Mary Bateman Folk. That's ko-fi dot com forward slash mary bateman folk and you can donate whatever you fancy even if it's just buying me a coffee or buying beth a coffee um to show your appreciation for the gig if you've enjoyed it um but in the meantime i have a song for you um while we're on the subject of ravens in fact now this is by far and away the oldest song that we will be singing that i will be singing this evening um it's so old in fact that it's one of those folk songs that Sometimes you hear folk musicians singing it. Sometimes you hear classical singers like Andreas Scholl uh, singing their own renditions of this song. Um, because indeed it's Elizabethan, the version that I will be playing, and it's probably much older. Um, with my medievalist hat on, I would suggest that some of the themes in the song, such as the uh, beloved of the slain knight, first of all, there's a knight who's been slain in the field, so that's quite medieval, but his beloved comes in the form of a dove deer. And anyone who knows uh, their you know, medieval romance and their medieval folklore will know that fallow deer, uh, doe deer are often a symbol for the beloved anyway, following on from kind of Ovid and the idea of the love chase. Um, so this is called The Three Ravens and I have to say before I start singing that um, Dora Darling who's another or Dora Darling Swan who's a wonderful fantastic local uh, folk musician based in Glastonbury who I love dearly and I really love her singing. Has it's done her amazing. Really talented she's worked with Beth before and Dora has got a version of The Three Ravens on her most recent EP um, and we've, what we've done is put a link to that as well in our kind of uh, resources stream underneath the videos so if anyone wants to listen to Dora's version and um, potentially buy some of her music then they can do that so thanks Dora for introducing me to this song because I really enjoy it <laughs> sat on a tree down a down a down hey down there were three ravens sat on a tree with a down there were three ravens sat on a tree and they were black as they might be With a down, down, and a dairy down, down. Then one he said unto his make with a down, a 
down, a down, hey down. And one he said unto his make with a down. And one he said unto his make, oh, where shall we our breakfast take? With a down, down, and a dairy down, down. Well, over in yonder green, green fields, down, a down, a down. that one of your friends was asking about is a similar song 
Is, is it the same song, different version? Um, yeah, Liz Thompson has asked about the Tway Corbys, which I have to say I nearly chose that one for my main performance tonight. And part of the reason why I didn't is just because um, Old Scots is a, is a challenge for me to pronounce, I guess. But I'm going to have a go at a couple of verses and I want to talk about it a little bit because it's a very interesting song when we compare it to The Three Ravens. Both of these songs are clearly very old. Uh, one is certainly The Three Ravens is Elizabethan. Uh, Twee Corby's By the Sound of the Scots uh, in the song, and also from some sources I've looked at, might be as old as the 14th century. Wow. Although it's difficult to know sometimes, of course, with these songs which aren't written down for a while. Um, but the difference that I find really interesting is that the Twee Corby's uh, version has a completely different ending to The Three Ravens. In The Three Ravens, we hear about uh, three birds who want to go and eat their breakfast. And that's the same in both songs. That's the same in The Twee Corby's, except there's two birds. They essentially want to go and eat. They find a knight who's been killed in a field and they think, excellent, let's tuck in. The difference is that in The Three Ravens, the three birds can't get close because even though the knight is dead, he has very, very faithful dogs that are lying at his feet and won't let them get nearby. And he's got falcons, hawks that are flying around and that won't let any birds come near him. And then the doe comes along and buries him and the doe presumably is a symbol for his beloved. Well, things don't work out that way in the Twa Corby's version because in the Twa Corby's version, he's lying in the field and then the two crows, uh, Corvid's ravens, I'm not sure which, announce that he has been abandoned by his dogs, his hounds, and his beloved has run off with another person as well. And then they go on to talk about how they're going to repurpose this knight's body, and it gets quite grim and wonderful. I'm going to sing those two verses to you now wow. <laughs> in Older Scots, just to get give you an idea, and hopefully you'll be able to follow what's going on and the kind of goriness as they talk about using his hair in their nests and picking out his eyes. Ooh, so this is... 13th century recycling. Exactly, yeah. I mean, well, what, what I find interesting is I wonder whether it's a satirical take on the other song or vice versa. One was an attempt to undo the damage in this song, I'm not sure. But clearly one songwriter maybe knew about the other version, maybe? Who knows? Anyway, this is two, two verses from the yeah. Twa Corbys. Okay, here's my, my attempt at Scots. Ye'll sit on his white house bane, and I'll pick out his bonny blue ane. We'll lock o his golden hair, o. We'll thick our nest when it grows bare, o. We'll thick our nest when it grows bare. There's money a in for him, Max Main, but nain sell can for his gain, or his white bains when they are bare. Oh, the wind sail blow for ever, mare. Oh, the wind sail blow for ever, mare. There you go. So that's wow. a, a couple of verses of the. Of, did you follow that? <laughs> yeah, yeah. You can kind uh, of hear it. Yeah, oh, absolutely. They thicken up their nest when their nest goes thin. They're going to use his hair to thicken it up. Exactly. Pick pull out, out his blue, blue eyes. eyes and... Yeah. It's a real memento mori, which is quite common in medieval and early modern um, literature anyway. What's a, a, what's a memento mori? Memento mori is the reminder of death. It's the reminder that even beautiful, bonny young knights with lovely golden hair and blue eyes and hawks and ladies and all of this are still not uh, pr not immune to death. Um, so in a way that positions the raven or or the, the crow in quite a powerful position because they are above, you know, the, the knight who's died. They can make of make nests out of his hair and things. So um yeah, that's quite a common thing. You see it a lot in poetry and literature of wow. the period. Oh, oh Liz Thompson I... has just let us know that Thiek is thatching, Scots for thatching, so for oh, literally thatch, thatching up second. their nests. Oh, Thanks oh, Liz, thank that's you, Liz. amazing. Right. It's really interesting. Um, oh, it's good to learn. I, I need to kind of like brush up, I think, on my older Scots a little bit. Well, um, you can't speak every language in the world, Mary. <laughs> <laughs> I guess there's only so much time in the day, isn't it? Absolutely. Um, but Beth's actually going to share, we're very, very lucky, everyone, because Beth's going to share some of her own writing now. Um, for those who don't know, or for those who know Beth as a storyteller, Beth is also a very, very, um, you know, in my words, I, I will say this, an excellent, excellent and um, quite uh, esteemed children's author and young adult fiction author. And I think she's written some other things as well. Um, and Beth's going to share some of her own work now and read it for us. What an absolute treat. Um, so do you want to let us know a bit, Beth, about what Brilliant. you're going to be doing? 
Thank you. <laughs> I like intros like that. Um, I'm going to read a part of this book, Fire Dreamer. Um, it's book two in a quadrilogy. A quadrilogy is a set of four books, or quartet, I find quartet, easier. Quadrilogy, tra tetralogy, I think there's a few different ways that, of that's saying That's the third one, isn't it? I don't know. Anyway, it's book two of a series of four books about the late Iron Age, just as the Romans are invading Britain. And um, in this book, uh, in book one, um, there's a very evil minded old woman called Derowin who raised a demon. And um, as often happens when one causes trouble that, or when one raises trouble and stirs up trouble, it often causes trouble for yourself. So she raised the demon and at the very end of book one, the demon actually kills her. Now in the culture at that time, uh, reincarnation was a very common concept, uh, but one always thought one would come back as a human being. But um, I tweaked that slightly, and in book two, Derowin, this very evil minded woman, comes back as a raven. Uh, so she is has the body of a raven, but the mind and spirit of the old witch. And so the chapter I'm about to read is about her coming into consciousness in her bird form and she's come back to do even more harm than before. So this is chapter two of my book, Fire Dreamer, and it's called First Flight. The uneasy spirit shifted inside the unfamiliar body. She wasn't used to he her new form yet. In fact, she didn't realize she'd been reborn. She only knew she was a young raven looking down on a world that seemed wrong. Early summer spread before her in a mist of tiny foliage and frothy blossom. The warm sun made her feel good. She stretched her wings and yawned, just as her father landed on the edge of the nest. Seeing a wide open beak, he pushed a strip of flesh into the waiting throat. The young raven swallowed, ignoring her sibling's squawks of jealousy. She didn't care. She rearranged her feathers and continued to watch the world below. She didn't know what it was she was looking for. A grub, maybe, or a fallen chick? Or a human girl in a blue dress, long black hair flying behind her as she chased a giggling child and a large mud-coloured dog. Scrambling up the side of the nest, she swayed unsteadily on the twiggy rim, the breeze lifted her rainbow black plumage as she stretched her wings to their fullest. Cool air caressed her flight feathers. She wasn't frightened, but she knew she longed to be amongst the dogs and the cats and the rats and all the other terrors her parents warned her of. Warned her of. The raven knew she had to fly. Fanning her tail, she walked to the sky. Delight! Delight! Now, she must do it, now. At that moment, her father shrieked, Stop, you're too young. You're, you'll fall. Your tail's too short. But the spirit within the bird was not fond of waiting and good counsel. She had been created from resentment, self-will and the desire to rule. She let the wind catch her outstretched pinions and launched herself into the air. She swooped, alive with menace and joy. She was flying. She could do it. She must do it. But a branch of apple blossom loomed. The raven lost control, then flapped and tumbled in an ignominious ball next to the human in blue. The girl put out her hand. Are you all right? Let me look. I won't hurt you. The raven jabbed her beak at the five fat worm shapes thrust towards her. She grabbed the middle one and tried to snap it. Ouch, the girl yelled, shaking her off. I was only trying to help. She sucked the blood that beaded from the cut. But the raven lifted her head and spread her ruff of neck feathers. She liked the taste of that blood. What was more, now she was on the ground, things began to look... Right. She recognised the world from this angle. Trees were meant to be seen from this way up, as was the human girl. 
The bird braced her feet as a band tightened around her puffed out chest. That feeling was familiar too. It was hate. Wow, great stuff, Beth. I love that. Um, that's from Beth's uh, the second book, I think, in the um, in the group. In the four books, yeah. Um, the Fire Dreamer, and I have to say they're wonderful. I remember reading the Star Dancer as when I was much younger, um, and really enjoying the setting, which I believe is pre-Roman Britain, didn't you say? Yeah, yeah, and that's what I remember about it as well. So, how did you go about researching some of the folklore? Because it's obviously quite an early period, isn't it, to write about, which presents some challenges. Well, in Somerset, we had something called the Pete Moore's Visitor's Centre, uh, which was a reconstructed Iron Age village. And I spent wow. a lot of time there. I remember um, going there as a kid as well. And thinking yeah, it was it's amazing. not there anymore, sadly. Oh, sad. um, it fell down, unfortunately. They got woodworm in the uh, wood supports of the huts and it was too expensive to rebuild. Oh. But I spent a lot of time there. I used to take kids from Kilve Court and get them to daydream there and imagine they were living in Iron Age life. Oh, and I spent a lot of time talking to the uh, to the curator, who was a great guy. Um, I read a lot of books. I've got rather too many books. And um, I also went to the Tower of London, and I had uh, spent a lovely day with the Raven Master. Um, oh, wow. He's not there now. It's a previous one. He was a lovely bloke, and he told me all sorts of Raven stuff. And I he... bet he had so much, so much, so many oh, stories to tell. He was fascinating and he introduced me to his ravens um and um ravens are very closely linked to the tower of london going back probably several thousand years i think pr probably uh well let me start with some modern history and then i'll go back and explain the past yeah um, so in the time of charles the second and this is the first recorded uh, first written record, record of linking ravens with the Tower of London. When Charles II was king, um, the astronomer royal had his telescopes at the tower, but the ravens kept doing their business on his lenses. And so the astronomer royal complained to the king, who was Charles II, and the king was going to have the ra ravens shot or killed somehow. And then someone said, sire, you mustn't do that because there's a, a story that the ravens um, belong at the tower and if they ever leave, um, then the king will fall and the, uh, the kingdom of uh, Britain will fall. And Charles II was slightly tetchy and worried on the subject of uh, kings losing their crowns because of what happened to his father. I bet. And <laughs> so he had the observatory moved to Greenwich where it is to this day. So that's why the observatory is at Greenwich. But the earliest legend that connects the tower with the ravens is an ancient Welsh tale uh, of a war between Britain and the Irish king, um, Mathulloch. Um, Mathulloch had married um, a British princess, Branwen, um, the sister of um, Bran the Blessed, the king of Britons in those days. And uh, Mathulloch badly mistreated Branwen. And when Bran heard of the mistreatment, he uh, took his followers over to Ireland and they defeated Mathulloch. And uh, it was a dreadful, bloody, horrible battle. Um, Branwen died of grief and Bran was mortally injured, but he, he survived to be taken back to Britain. And when he landed in Britain, he, told, he knew he wasn't going to survive, so he told his followers to cut off his head and to bury it in the White Hill in London. Now, the White Hill is actually the hill on which the Tower of London is um, built. Um, William the Conqueror had it built there. And he said that the head must be looking southwards towards France, and that would act as a sort of talisman to prevent um, any invasion of Britain. Now, it's been a very, very long held tradition. Oh, and Bran, of course, is the Welsh word for raven. And the knowledge that Bran's head is uh, buried under the hill and is protecting Britain is a very, very treasured story. Um, but I have heard it said that King Arthur had it dug up, demanding that Christ alone would protect our islands, uh, which would, of course, explain the Norman invasion. 
Um, so perhaps it was the uh, Norman kings who inserted that story because they did a lot of twiddling around with uh, Arthurian myths and legends. They certainly did. Um, <laughs> to say, yes, he was there, but of course, you know, that, that's why. Who knows? But during the Second World War, when most of the ravens died or flew away during the bombing, huge efforts were made to replace them immediately. So since the time of Bran, uh, ravens have only been missing from the tower for literally three or four days. That's amazing. That's really amazing. And isn't it incredible as well that, um, you know, it's hard to know when exactly that legend really did start, but it's certainly associated with a very, very early period um, in, um, you know, British history. Um, so the fact that people were still superstitious about that during the Second World War is quite fascinating to me, really. Um, really interesting. Well, I think during hard times like now, people cling on to any good thing that they can. I think it's psychologically very important. Mm -hmm. And I guess also legends like that are very potentially, like you can see how they could be quite like nationalistic in nature as well, potentially. Well, um, they yeah. sort of build up your confidence a bit when you feel you're under attack. Hmm. Yeah, really interesting stuff. Have you, are you a, a medievalist and you specialise in Arthur? Have you heard that story before? I have to say it was one that came to my attention rather late, in fact. Um, but I've, I've looked into a little bit now and oh, it's been wonderful hearing your telling of it. I do have a good friend called Lily Hawker Yates, who uh, is a researcher over in Canterbury and um, an archaeologist. And she's just written her PhD thesis on the history of barrows in the cultural imagination. And I'm pretty sure that um, the head, the buried head of Bran uh, gets a mention in her thesis, actually. Wow. Um, I'll have to check in with her and see. But yeah, interesting stuff. Um, a lot of, uh, this is just a slight change in tack. A lot of stories about ravens say they became black as punishment for misdeeds. Mm. Now, although some of these stories actually predate Christianity, and we'll hear one uh, of them later, some people believe that this was introduced by white missionaries. Like spread around to different places by white yeah. missionaries kind of thing. Um, That's really interesting. Which, of course, is, is a very horrid and, and sort of racist thing to do. But there, uh, there's one story I particularly love where a white raven becoming black is a badge of honour. Oh, fantastic. And yeah. I'd like to tell that. It's a Canadian First Nation story from the Haida Gwaii people. Uh, and it can also be found in, in Tlingit territory. I got it right that time, Tlingit. Uh, so this is sort of north of Seattle and up the west coast and up the northwest coast of Canada. Um, and it's how the raven helped to bring the sun, moon, stars, fresh water and fire to the world. Long ago, near the beginning of the world, Grey Eagle was given the charge of the sun, the moon, the stars, fresh water and fire. But he loathed humanity. He was an irascible old bird, unkind, mean-minded. And he kept these precious gifts in his longhouse, used them for his own pleasure. And when he'd finished with them, he put them in great leather bags that he hung on the wall of the longhouse. Now, Raven was white in these early days, and he was in love with Grey Eagle's daughter, who wasn't nearly as mean as her father. But she invited the Raven to come and meet her father so that they could get his approval for them to wed. So Grey Eagle invited the Raven to his longhouse, and the stay was very successful. Grey Eagle liked and respected Raven, and the marriage was agreed to. But... The raven was shocked and horrified when he saw how, how Grey Eagle hoarded these magnificent gifts in his longhouse and used them just for himself and his daughter and his own pleasure. And that night, after they had feasted and drunk, Grey Eagle and his daughter both went to bed. Raven sat awake and stared at the great bulging bags on the wall of the longhouse and stared up as the smoke went from the fire up through the up through the roof of the longhouse, and he hatched a plan. He knew what he must do. When he was certain his hosts were asleep, he crept over to the walls where the sacks hung, and he lifted them down with his claws and placed them by the hearth. 
And then with his beak, he took a burning brand from out of the fire. He clutched the bags in his claws and he spread his wings and he flew up through the smoke hole and out into the night. The bags were so heavy. He let the first one go immediately and that was the sun. And the great golden globe sprang into the sky and light spread throughout the world and it was beautiful. It was magnificent. But Raven didn't have time to stop and wonder, for he knew Grey Eagle could wake at any moment and he must get away. So in the light of the sun, he flew and flew and flew until he came to the sea. And there in the middle of the sea, he spotted a small island. And there he flew down and he rested for his wings ached. And as he rested, so too the new sun became tired and started to sink down and disappear in the west. Now Raven had never seen a sunset before and he didn't know whether the sun would come back or not. And so he opened the second bag and put the moon up in the sky with its pale silvery light. And then he opened the third bag with the stars and he embroidered the night skies and put all the stars in the correct places. And it was wonderful. And by their pale light, he lifted up the last bag that still had fresh water. And he flew and he flew and he flew. And he could hear the furious screeching of grey owls somewhere behind him. But he flew on and on and on until he came to land again. But he was so tired. He went up into the hills and he let go of the fourth bag that contained all the fresh water in the world. And the water spilled over the hillsides and became pools and streams and rivers that we now know and love. And the grey eagle was beginning to home in on Raven. Closer and closer he came and the raven flapped and flapped. But he couldn't fly much further for the smoke and soot from the burning brand was covering his feathers and sticking to his flight feathers and making it difficult to fly. And the soot was getting up his beak and into his nose. So he went up into a crevice in the mountains and dropped the fire. And there it sunk into the crack. And it's there to this day, for if you go up many mountains, they might even be volcanoes. And deep, deep down, you can hear the bubbling and the hissing of the fire and the lava. And if you get two stones now, especially if they're flints and bang them together, the sparks of fire will spring free. But the grey eagle never did catch the raven for his feathers had turned black and Raven found it useful to hide. And the grey eagle never recognised him and never found him. And the raven rather liked his suit of black shiny feathers. And to those people of Northwest Canada, those First Nations, wearing black and being black is a sign of a badge of honour. Oh, Beth, that was wonderful and a really nice um, kind of corrective, I think, to a lot of the stories that we've heard this evening where ravens are turned black as a punishment. It's interesting and I think important to hear that that is not uh, kind of the standard everywhere in the world and that there are these different stories out there. Um, yeah, that was really, really wonderful. Uh, I really enjoyed that. Um, a few people on the live stream um, have been commenting. Um, Liz has been um, uh, giving us some tips about, um, apparently she remembers uh, hearing the To Our Corbys back uh, as a poem in school in the 60s, which is amazing to hear that it was still being uh, shared and everything, and it has continued to be shared um, in schools and in, in educational settings. Um, and Jamie, I'll share this with you later, Beth, if we have time, but um, Jamie has shared a wonderful um, parody with me um, of Edgar Allan Poe called The End of the Raven by Edgar Allan Poe's Cat. And this is from Henry Beard's uh, uh, Poetry for Cats. I will share that with you in a little bit. But in the meantime, I have one more song and this will be my last song of the evening. Thank you for those of you who are still with us and hello to those of you who've joined us since um, a little bit later. It's the beauty of these online things, isn't it? Um, if people are really enjoying um, themselves this evening, um, don't forget that you can make a little donation if you want to on the Ko-Fi page, which is linked below the feed. I know that Jamie has already made a donation. Thank you, Jamie. We really appreciate it. We love your poem as well. Um, it's just uh, ko-fi ko dot com slash Mary Bateman Folk and all the proceeds will be split between myself and Beth for the evening. 
Um, but, so, by the way, someone's just said that they thought this show wasn't until Friday. Are, are we doing it on the right night? It is Friday, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, the 19th. Yeah, I think it's Friday. Have we got the date? Yeah, it's definitely. I suddenly thought after all our technical hitches, uh, have we got the right we day? Got the day wrong. <laughs> no, I, it's definitely Friday. Don't worry, I get my days muddled up all the time okay. and stuff. Um, oh, so this is my You've got song. another song. I have another song and I couldn't do a night about Covid without this song. It's a real modern classic, but it feels like it's been it's a traditional song it feels like it's been around forever and that's because it was a song written by Sydney Carter oh, um, and for work. those of you who aren't in the know get yourselves in the know because Sydney Carter wrote some incredible songs and a lot of them you'll probably be very familiar with um, because they are very well loved uh, songs um, and the one I'm going to share is particularly sad and I actually performed this live on the radio the other day um, on Glastonbury FM I think as a little warm up for the gig it's called The Crow on the Cradle. Now, the interesting... Oh, my headphones falling out. The... There we are. Um, the interesting thing about this song, uh, and I think... Oh, I keep dropping my headphones. Dear me, they're meant to stay in your ear. Where's it gone? Anyway, I'll keep talking. The reason why this song interests me is because I think it sums up the whole evening for me, because it's not clear in this song whether the crow is the baddie, you know, is the crow the character that's bringing all of the negative things that it's singing about that happen in the song? Um, or is the crow a more of a prophetic character, like some of the other crows of our stories this evening? Uh, is the crow speaking truth to humanity about the atrocities that humanity commits on itself, on each other? Um, and you can really hear that in the song um, and sort of, uh, yeah, written kind of like post-World war, post -World war II, I think. Um, around that kind of time so you can hear a lot of the pain in the lyrics of the song so it's quite a moving one um so this is my last song and it's the crow on the cradle i should also say that show of hands do a really fantastic version of this oh yeah um, yeah good old um, steve knightley and phil beer and, and comrades really lovely version of this song um so this is my rendition <laughs> Scrimp and they'll save to 
buy you a coffin and dig you a grave. So hush a bye, little one, never you weep. I've got a toy that'll put you to sleep. Sign the Fetch me a gun and I'll shoot that bird dead That's what your father and mother once said For the crow on the cradle, now what shall we do? This is the thing that I leave up to you Sang the crow on the cradle. Ooh. As you say, that could be taken either way as a you know, the the bring the prophet or the bringer of doom or both or neither. Yeah, I think it's an interesting one because I think that the twist almost comes at the end. Um, you think all the way through that it's the crow that's bringing all of these things into being by singing about them. But then at the end, this is the thing that I leave up to you. The Sydney Carter's putting it back into our hands and he's actually kind of making a point there that maybe all of these things that we blame on superstition, that we blame on magpies and crows and ravens and goodness knows what else, um, are quite often d done at our own hands. You know, that's what I get out of that song. I think it's amazing. Apparently there were some psychological studies done, I can't quote the reference off the top of my head, that people who believe in bad luck tend to have bad things happen to them. Yeah, I've heard it's that. It's statistically demonstrated. It's an interesting one, but um, it's just such a tragic song, that one. And I don't think that we could have done this evening without it, even though there are so many wonderful oh, songs about Corvids and things. Fabulous um, So that's my last song of the evening. But um, Beth is going to um, kind of close the night now with a slightly longer story. Um, this is real classic storytelling, this one. It's a, an opinion, I believe, um, which I've, I only sort of like, top of my, my mind this kind of thing because I've been teaching uh, Christopher, um, Christopher Marlowe's hero in Leander recently which is a kind of early modern opinion. Um, it's like a small epic style story with a mini story tucked into the middle of it and Beth do you want to tell us a bit about this one? Excellent thank you opinion I must remember that word. So the final story is Apollo and Coronis it's a story told by Ovid who is a, a Roman storyteller, but it concerns the sacred Mount of Olympus. So I'm going to use the Greek names for the gods. And it's a very strange story. Um, it does add two more Corvidae to our count, a jackdaw and a raven. But uh, the end of the story sends shivers up my spine. It was really weird that it was written so long ago but the ending is so pertinent and so relevant. Um, now, I'm not going to say any more. I'm just going to leave people to enjoy the story. And I hope you like it. Ovid. Apollo and Coronis. The raven used to be as white as a swan with opalescent gleam on his feathers. He was vain and he talked too much as you will hear. And he had a job. He was Apollo's messenger come spy. And Apollo had great need for a, a spy at the time of this story, for he was in love. He had fallen for a human princess called Coronis. And Coronis was the daughter of the king of Thessaly. And she was gorgeous. He was everything, she was everything a god could possibly want. And, of course, she was pregnant. It's a bit difficult saying no to a god. But she didn't actually love Apollo. She didn't even like him. She said he was too much full of glitz and bling and glamour and zap pow. 
I'm a god, yeah, I'm Apollo, I'm the Apollo. She had eyes only for a young man called Iscus, and she adored him. But she knew that Apollo would be watching her. So Iscus only ever came to her chamber after the shutters were shut at night and the room was darkened. But still, the raven used to sit on an olive tree outside her window and watch and wait. And after one particular night, which had been filled with the sounds of laughter and pleasure, at dawn, the shutters were thrown open and there was Coronis looking out at the sunrise and saying, isn't this beautiful? And in that one moment of forgetfulness, Iscus came and stood beside her, put his arms around her and kissed her neck and nibbled her ear and filled her with joy. And the raven, seeing this, now had proof. He spread his wings and he flew as fast as he could to Mount Olympus. But it was a long flight, even for a special bird. And he was glad of company when a jackdaw flapped beside him and said, Good morning, brother. What news do you have? I have news indeed, said the raven, full of himself. And he told the jackdaw everything that he had seen and how he was going to tell his master Apollo about Coronus's unfaithfulness and how he would be rewarded and honoured. And the jackdaw went very quiet and then said, Brother, I beg you, forget it. Turn round, go back, for no good will come of this. The raven looked at the jackdaw and said, well, I'm sorry, Apollo is my master. You're a mere jackdaw. You don't understand these things. And the jackdaw said, brother, I do understand. For I was not always a wild bird and a scavenger. I used to be the faithful handmaiden of the goddess Athene. But she's got an owl, said the raven. She came later said the jackdaw. I used to be her handmaiden, her bosom companion, but I told the truth and I was punished for it. What happened? said the raven. Well, said the jackdaw, a long, long time ago, as you know, Athene swore perpetual virginity, but Hephaestus, the god of smiths, really fancied her. He lusted after her. He wanted her and he pursued her, and he caught her alone in a quiet place, and he caught her in his clutches, and he had muscles as big as anvils, he was strong as iron, he had a grip like steel, but Athene managed to wriggle and slide and get free, but Hephaestus was so full of lust, and so full of fire for her that he came on her leg just as she wriggled free. She was disgusted. She grabbed a wad of sheep's wool from a nearby bramble and wiped herself clean and flung it away. But where the sperm landed on the ground, the goddess of the earth, Gaia, became pregnant. And pregnancy doesn't last long amongst the gods. With Hephaestus's seed and her earth, the earth began to heave and rise and split open, and there was a little baby boy. Now Hephaestus had gone, he'd had his fun, he was that sort of a bloke, but Athene had compassion for this child. She picked him up and looked at him, and then she saw to her horror the top half was a perfect child, but the lower half was a writhing serpent. She didn't know what to do. She needed time to think, but she couldn't leave the child here. He was innocent. She took off her cloak, wrapped the child and leapt back up to Olympus. She fed the child ambrosia to give him life. And then she wove a box of withies and lined it with silk and laid the child in it. And then she wove another lid and strapped it on with tight fastenings. And then she took it back down to earth and found three girls, sisters, who were devotees of hers, and she trusted them. And she gave them this box and said, whatever you do, do not open it, just guard it. I give you my jackdaw here, and if you have need to get a message to me, the jackdaw will fly, but do not open it. 
And the girls swore in their lives that they would not. And Athene went back to Olympus and I sat there and watched. The first and the second girls were faithful to their duty. But when the third and the youngest was watching, the child began to wriggle and writhe and cry. The girl was frightened and, and could hear a child. She, she didn't know what to do. And she unlift, undid the fastenings and lifted up the lid. And she screamed because there was a child she thought being strangled by a serpent. Her sisters came running and they wrenched the serpent away and then realized it was the lower half of this poor boy. And they looked at each other and they said, so much for Athene being a virgin. This must be some love child of hers. And they began to gossip and spread malicious news. I flew straight to Athene, said the jackdaw, and I told her, I told her honestly and fairly what had happened, and she cursed me and sent me from her sight never to darken her door again. She never wanted to set eyes on me again. But why, I said, I brought you the news faithfully. I was honest. Yes, she said, but now there's malicious gossip about me. You should have flown in the girl's eyes. You should have pecked out her eyes rather than let her see what was in that box. Now lies will be told and my virginity will be no longer believed. You have failed me. Be gone. So, said the jackdaw, raven brother, I beg you, do not tell. Because when Apollo's child is born from Coronis, he will tire of her. He'll tire quickly. He will take the child. It may become a god. It may not, but it will be a hero. And then she will be free. He will be tired of her. She will be no longer sylph-like and virginal. He'll let her go. She can marry her Ickis or anybody else she wants to. Just don't say a word. Keep your beak shut. But the raven was determined. My God, Apollo, loves me and trusts me. It is my duty, said the raven. You were just some bird. Athene never really loved you. The jackdaw fell silent and said, she did. For I was not always a bird. I was too was a princess, like the fair Coronis. I was black, I was beautiful. I had stars for eyes, I was perfect. And my father, the king, had no other children. And so he sought good suitors for me that I may marry the best man in the world. And the suitors came. And my father told me to go for a walk along the beach while he interviewed them to see who would be the most suitable husband for me. And I obeyed. But as I walked along the beach, the god Poseidon saw me and lusted after me. And he sent his little wavelets to tickle my toes and to swirl around my ankles and to tempt me deeper into the water. But I jumped aside. And I said, no, Poseidon, no, I'm to be wed. And then Poseidon grew angry and he sent bigger and bigger waves and he stroked my knees and he kissed my thighs with his salty kisses. And I leapt from the water and I said, no, my Lord, I will be a virgin on my wedding night. But Poseidon was having none of it and he oozed his water amongst the sand, turning it into quicksand, which sucked at my feet and dragged me down. I called out to gods and men to save me. And then Athene heard me. She turned my cloak into black feathers and it lifted like wings. And I thanked the goddess and I raised my hands to bless her. And then I realized my hands were no longer hands, but part of the wings, black feathers were growing along my fingers. I had no mouth, I now had a beak. And I said, lady, I need to be saved, but I'm to be married, I need to stay a girl. I don't want to be a bird. But I was already flying skimming above the water, flying free of Poseidon's grip. I flew straight to my lady Athene and she took me and gave me the job of being her handmaid, her servant, her friend, her familiar. I served her lovingly and faithfully. And even then she cast me out. So brother Raven, once more, I beg you, do not go to Apollo. But the Raven just said, it's tittle-tattle, it's stories. Go and tell your stories to someone else. Come, here is Olympus, I must fly on. 
and the jackdaw having no wish to go any nearer Olympus than she need, settled on a tree by a lake and waited. And the raven flew on and up and into Apollo's hall and he landed on the god's shoulder and he flapped his wings and said, ha, Coronis has made a fool of you. She's cuckolded you. Everybody on earth is laughing at you. Apollo grew furious and shoved the bird away. What do you mean, he said. The raven told him. Apollo grew pale and he made a ball of fire and smoke and thunder in his hands and he cursed the raven, making it black and sooty. Thou foul bird, how dare you come in here and mock me? Go back and watch Coronis and bring me news, but bring it in humility. Do not mock the gods. The jack, the raven slunk away and flew back down to the lake where he washed and washed, but the gods' fury was so strong. His feathers regained their gleam, but they were black. And up in the tree, the jackdaw laughed. The gods are tricksy, tricksy and unkind, she said. I told you so. And the raven flew back to Coronis's window sill. Meanwhile, Apollo went to his sister Artemis, the bringer of disease, and begged her for vengeance upon Coronis and everyone she loved. Artemis was delighted to help. She took a whole quiver of darts which had been poisoned and dipped in pestilence and she put them in her blowpipe and sent them down to earth. The first caught Coronis in her heart and then her father, her sisters, her brothers, the courtiers, everybody in Thessaly became ill. And the raven on the windowsill watched Coronis lying, sweating, tossing and turning in her bed. And she saw him there and she said, go to your master Apollo and tell him I deserved my fate, but I do not repent for I never loved Apollo. The child is his though. And if he has one ounce of compassion, may he save the child. I am happy to die for I, believed in Ichis. I did not believe in Apollo. He was cruel, he was flashy. He never really loved me or he would have been kinder. Go, I beg you, beg for the life of our child. And she lay back in her pillows and the raven flew back to Apollo without stopping to greet any other bird. He entered Apollo's hall, bowed his head and said, master, and gave the message. Apollo was stricken with grief and repentance that he had been so hasty and so angry. And he leapt immediately to earth and he saw that Coronis had just breathed her last and the men were coming to take her body and to put it on the funeral pyre. And he drew his dagger and he cut out the child who was still alive. He wrapped him in a bedsheet called him Asclepius. Coronis he put up in the stars as the constellation of the Corvus, which means the crow, but it also is a pun, it also means the curve. So whether it is referring to the raven's beak or Coronis's curve, curve of her hip or the curve of her breast, who knows? But the child, Asclepius, he took to Chiron the wisest of all the centaurs. And once the child was weaned and of an age to learn, Chiron taught him philosophy and medicine. And the child learned quickly and well. By the time he was 12, he had brought many back from the shores of the river Styx. And one day he found a serpent which was injured and bruised. And the boy healed him and restored him with an ointment of his own devising. The serpent was so grateful, it twisted up the staff that Asclepius was carrying and whispered in his ear secrets of healing that even Chiron knew nothing of. And when Asclepius became a man and set up the first medical practice on earth, he hung outside the door a wooden carving of a serpent on a staff. 
so that any seeing it might know that in there they would find healing and hope. A little later, Asclepius married a beautiful girl called Epione, and she, her name meant soothing and relief from pain, and she bore him seven children, four girls and three boys, and Asclepius taught them all his skills in medicine. Hygieia, the eldest, learned about cleanliness, diet, physical exercise, and hygiene is named after her. Panacea learned about cures and treatments that could heal many ailments. Akeso studied what we now call immunology. And Iasso became an expert in recovery. The boys became army doctors and served in the Trojan War, as described by Homer. And then some say when Asclepius died, Zeus took him and put him in the stars as the constellation of the serpent bearer. Others say Zeus restored him to life and he became a god, as did his wife and his daughters. But what I love about this story is that because of Coronis, deadly disease came into the world. But from Coronis was born a new medicine, healing and hope for humanity. Wow, Beth, well done. Firstly, for remembering that, because there's a lot in there. Um, but also, what a weird coincidence um, for our evening um, that, you know, we've done this COVID-19 gig. And here you are with this story about Coronis that's all about um, kind of disease, and but also healing and recovery as well. It just feels like a fitting way to end. That um, story is over 2,000 years old, and it feels sort of like Oh, it's like like a prophecy almost. It's really weird. You can kind of tell it's two thousand years old in some in some places. I think like because some of the themes and things that um, Ovid um, Ovid brings up, you don't hear as much in in um, in stories written today. Some quite dark parts of the story. Um, but Beth, that was really wonderful. Thank you so much, and what a fitting end to the evening. And thank um, you for your music. That was amazing. Oh, it's been a real pleasure. Before we close, I just wanted to quickly share something really funny that Jamie Russell has shared with me. Jamie's one of our audience members, and I have been keeping an eye on the comments as the evening goes on. And also just to like check, check in and remind people that if, you, if you're really enjoying yourself this evening and want to donate, you can. I've put some, some links there in the comment thread. But Jamie, who's been a wonderful audience member tonight, shared a hilarious parody um, of part of Edgar Allan Poe. Um, oh, yeah. Poe's Raven. And I just wanted to quickly read it, Beth, because I think you'll really enjoy this. It's called The End of the Raven by Edgar Allan Poe's Cat. And the poem is actually from Henry, Be <laughs> Henry Beard's Poetry for Cats. Oh, it gets so much better, believe me. Henry Beard's Poetry for Cats. I know that whatever that collection is, I need to go away and read more of it because it's funny and I know Beth will like it. So here's, uh, here's, here's um, The End of the Raven. On a night quite unenchanting, when the rain was downward slanting, I awakened to the ranting of the man I catch mice for. Tipsy and a bit unshaven, in a tone I found quite craven, Poe was talking to a raven perched above the chamber door. Raven's very tasty, thought I, as I tiptoed over the floor. There is nothing I like more. Soft upon the rug I treaded, calm and careful, as I headed towards his roost atop that dreaded bust of palace I deplore. While the bard and birdie chattered, I made sure that nothing clattered, creaked, or snapped, or fell, or shattered as I crossed the corridor. For his house is crammed with trinkets, curios, and weird decor, bric-a-brac and junk galore. Still the raven never fluttered, standing stock still as he uttered, in a voice that shrieked and sputtered his two cents worth, nevermore! While this dirge the bird brain kept up, oh so silently I crept up, then I crouched, and quickly leapt up, pouncing on the feathered boar. Soon he was a heap of plumage, and a little blood and gore. Only this, and not much more. Ooh, my pickled poet cried out, Pussycat, it's time I dried out. Never sat I in my hideout, talking to a bird before. How I've wallowed in self-pity, 
while my gallant, valiant kitty put an end to that damned ditty. Then I heard him start to snore. Back atop the door I clambered, eyed that statue I abhor, jumped and smashed it to the floor. And there we go. Oh, that's wonderful. Will you well, thank whoever sent that? Yeah, that was, that was from Jamie. I have to say, Jamie, um, uh, well done for sharing because we really, that has made our evening. And um, it's added to the crow tally. Yeah, and brings in another wonderful animal, the cat, which Beth and I are both big fans of. So, um, yeah. yeah, we're definitely over 19 now because we've got another one. Or is it a revival of the other crow? I don't know. Oh, no. Oh, no. I suppose, <laughs> yes. I don't this know. Is... I've lost count. I, I'm, I think there's about 23. This is how we end up debating, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, brilliant. Well, I guess that concludes our show, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so, so, so much for joining us. We've really enjoyed having you here. Um, we will leave this video up in its respective places. If people want to click through and watch later, then they can. Um, and if you've really enjoyed it and you want to see more of Beth's storytelling, I've linked to both of her YouTube channels in the comments sections. If you type Beth Webb Storyteller on YouTube, she should pop up. There is a adult storytelling channel for tales a bit more like these and one that's more kid friendly on kid YouTube as well. Um, and um, there's also a link there to a website where you can buy some of Beth's books. So if you really enjoyed Fire Dreamer and you want to encounter the whole tetralogy, quadrol or whatever it's quadrology, quadrilogy, uh, any, quadrilogy one of those things, not sure, um, on your own, then you, you can go and buy a copy of her book. I've got them. I re really recommend them. I think they're brilliant stories and just so imagine such an imaginative retelling of, of pre and Where can we get your music and uh, Dora Darling's music? If you've really enjoyed my singing tonight, I am... Um, I have my YouTube channel anyway, but you can also um, stream and download my music on Spotify, iTunes, Amazon Music, any of your kind of regular music uh, kind of purchasing and streaming platforms. You should be able to get hold of, of my music on there. I've got an EP out, but the songs that I've done this evening are all very special. This is sort of first time performances of all of them. Uh, and if you've really enjoyed them, then let me and Beth know, because maybe we can record our own renditions, especially of Hugan and Moon in the song that we wrote. Oh, yeah. Um, so and of course, I should also plug one more mention for our Ko-Fi of people who have really enjoyed it. We've had so many really generous donations already. I've seen them coming in and we're so grateful. Thank you so much. It means a lot. Um, if anyone else would like to chip in something, even just like buy us a coffee, you can do that. It's co-fi, ko-fi dot com slash mary bateman folk and despite the name we will be splitting all of <laughs> all of the donations between the two of us um at the end of everything um and i should also mention as well dora darling swan go and have a listen to her um dora darling.com is her website i believe and i've linked it again in the um in the um yeah, on uh, both comments. our Facebook pages, yeah. you'll find yeah, lists it is of everything. Com, and she's got a great version of The Three Ravens that's worth listening to. And it's, you know, a good time to support local music artists and performers yeah. and things. So definitely go and give Laura a listen. Um, and yeah, we just really hope that you've enjoyed the evening. And thank, thank you, you for, for joining us. us. Hopefully yeah. we'll do another one of these at some point, because I've had a great time, except for the technical issues <laughs> at the beginning. <laughs> but never mind. Great. Well, take, take care. Keep safe. And hope to see you again soon. Thank you Bye for having everyone. us. Thank you. Bye. We love you very much. Bye.